My name is Glenn Komatsu. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Providence Trinity Care Hospice. My name's Roland Summit. I am both a client of Community Care Hospice, also a, a client of Trinity Care Hospice through the death of my wife. I am a community psychiatrist, retired. Can you tell us a little bit about your career? I had the opportunity to join the faculty in psychiatry at what was then Harbor General Hospital. I met a woman with the compulsion to kill her own daughter as a result of her own childhood victimization. And the fact that nobody professionally could handle that and would just pass it off with a, oh, you wouldn't do that sort of thing. So she and another social worker founded a group which became Parents Anonymous. I became the founding board member of this organization. I heard many stories of abusive behavior, both as children and as parents, and I became the, the go-to guy for conferences on child abuse. I was able to put together a pattern of behavior which contradicted the prejudice against children who were not believed. Your work in this area was absolutely visionary and pioneering. Thank you. So tell us about sort of the culture of medicine at that time towards death and dying. Medicine developed as a hope to prevent death, as a plan to prolong life. And the more skillful we became to keep people alive, the more it was a fight against a person's right to die. Uh, The chief resident bringing his patient to the hospital to die and to avoid any way to prolong her life. And he did constant battle with the faculty for the outrageous neglect of this patient who was in the process starving and dehydrating. But I would hold her hand and give her a piece of ice to suck on occasionally, and she would say, will it be soon? And I would say, yes, and she would smile. So without belaboring the point, doctors, in my experience, uh, and during my years of work as a community psychiatrist were squadrons against death. And I didn't understand hospice philosophy very much until Jo herself was terminally ill. Tell us a little bit about the love of your life. Jo was somebody I saw around campus at first as a beautiful redhead. It happened that we worked together waiting tables in one of the women's dorms at Pomona College, where we met. We became buddies, sharing meals before waiting tables. And Joe, looking back on our relationship, said that I was the first guy she ever knew that she could be totally comfortable with. And that's the way it was. For the rest of my life and 60 years of marriage, I was the luckiest guy in the world. She was apparently born loving horses and had a chance to ride her aunt's horses. And next best was riding the merry-go-round at the Pike in Long Beach. And when she was just short of her 10th birthday, that whole machine burned to charred wood. And she used her artistic skill to try and reincarnate those bodies by painting them again and again and again. And we were married two years before I realized it would be very important for her to have her own carousel horse, which then was a gift for our second anniversary. And together, we got into this hobby and began collecting carousel horses. She had a gift of color balances that she built into the horses we restored. And then came a time when she couldn't do that. I wasn't able to convince her that she was undergoing dementia. And I watched that happen over those years. For a while, she'd be doing okay, but resentful of 
of care and sleeping in a hospital bed instead of together. Any of our reassurances fell on dead ears, and when she went to the operating room to get a new hip, she drew me down, said, Raul, I don't want to survive as an Alzheimer's victim. I might not even know you, or I could set fire to the house. Don't let that happen to me. A neighbor across the street, a good friend, had been dying in the hospital, and we heard her story of being delivered by this magic man who was part of the hospice who brought her home to die. It was only through her daughter's referral of Trinity Care that we met you. You know, I'm not sure I believe in magic. I don't know what I believe in about spirits, but it was as if peace had come into our house. But after you, Glenn Komatsu, came into the house, interviewed Joe, seeing Joe respond to you favorably, where many of the men who came in, she rejected. After you drew us into another room and said three words that changed our lives and changed our ability to deal positively with Joe. We sat down, looked at us, and you said, Joe is dying. You were there for more than 20 minutes. You seemed to be willing to be there all afternoon. That was another magic part about your visit. But you were able to explain that when she ended up in intensive care and described to me that the curtains surrounding her isolated bed were now a trellis of flowers. Obviously, she was hallucinating and going crazy. I didn't know that somebody faced with death and and incomprehensible confusion could flower the environment with something that looks good. I mean, you could tell me that again better than I'm trying to repeat it. But you shared the s- clinical science of end-of-life experience, which nobody had ever taught me before. And that's one of the reasons why, after she died, I declared for myself three missions. One, honor that family that had taught us so much about their lives creating carousels, that I wanted to write the definitive book of their lives. The other was to do everything I could, both physically and financially, to support Trinity Care for people who could experience what we experienced. And I've forgotten the third. It had something to do with my own survival. And and that has gone rather well. But you were there for us, and suddenly everything changed. And it was only a long month between the time you arrived and the the day she died that our lives changed. But in the afternoon, I would lie with her, cuddling on the bed. She would hope she would be relaxed enough to die. She needed to die. I couldn't have understood that or joined in that wholeheartedly without your help. Your whole team met our needs and warmed our house so beautifully, and you were gracious enough to be there several times yourself. You rediscovered an obsolete drug I used to dispense by the handful that spared her the night terrors. You rebuilt our lives together in the space of a month. Certainly, though I can never quite know how she felt, it was what she needed. Let me tell you sort of my version. This is a very warm, loving house that I walked into and uh, surrounded by the carousel horses. I was thinking, wow, this is a different house. Such loving children, so much love in your family. Joe was so beautiful, not only in her appearance, but in her words of articulating how she felt. Even with her dementia, she had these periods of lucidity where she would say, like, why am I still alive? Please don't prolong my dying. The night terrors were 
quite distressing to me, and I was really determined to try and find some way to relieve those because I thought these night terrors were some of the worst I had heard of. You know, the images that she was seeing were so disturbing, involving violence against her own family members. But she was very persistent in her wishes and very consistent, saying, you know, this is not a life that I want to live. To you and your children's credit, you listen, and not all families listen. And it was you that helped give her the gift of a more peaceful passing. Frankly, I had my own fears of living her life in deteriorating dementia. I wasn't a very good cook. I wasn't very well organized. I was stressed trying to help take care of her. If I would let myself go there... I could say, well, you should die, but, you know, I couldn't do that either. I return the favor and the credit to you for opening my eyes, and I'm glad that I wasn't one of those people who didn't hear you. Hard for me to imagine that. You're you're a wonderfully outpouring guy. Thanks, Ralph. Talk a little bit about your philanthropic efforts on our behalf. You have been incredibly generous. Money was never something I had to give away. The kids were out of college, and all of a sudden, Joe and I had more money than we'd ever had before. Joe dying first gave me full retirement credit for the rest of my life, and I still had the same kind of frugal lifestyle. I haven't changed. So the change has been to funnel that to one basic charity rather than several. Having money is a pleasure to spend now for others, not to spend on myself. Thank you, bro. 